Well, as I said, we're in the last week of this series called You Make Me Brave. And, and again, with, if you're new with us, we teach in a series, so it's kind of like episodes in a show, right? So you're at the, the back end of this series. And if you miss the ones that we've done before, I want to encourage you guys to go online and to check those out. You can go to northway.org and then click on watch a message and you can catch every message that we do at every campus, even on these live weekends as well. And so I want to encourage you guys to go back and check those out. There have been some really great messages coming out of this series. Last week, we had Pastor Freedom Blackwell from our East End campus, and he talked about uh, the fear of man or the fear of what people would think of us and how that impacts our life and our faith. Two weeks ago, Pastor Doug Melder from our Oakland campus, Doug talked about loneliness, and he talked about it in the context of singleness and marriage and the church and how those things work together and fill different gaps for each other. And then on Easter, our lead pastor, Scott Stevens, he kicked off the series by talking about a fear that I think everybody has at some point or another, right, is death. Everybody has that fear at some point or another. And he talked about this story of a, of a guy named Jarius. And Jarius had a little daughter. She was 12 years old. And, and from what we can tell, Jarius, he was a, a well-to-do man. He probably had some wealth to him. And, and it seems like in a last-ditch effort, he came to Jesus and he fell at Jesus' knee. And he said, heal my daughter. Please come and heal my daughter. And you guys, if you know the story, you know how it turns out, right? That, that a servant from the house comes up and he says, you know, stop bothering Jesus because she's died. And I can't imagine as a dad, I have three kids, but one of them is, is a, a, my daughter. And I can't imagine uh, having these new, this news delivered to me like Jarius did. But I can't imagine knowing Jesus. I, I can just imagine him putting his hands on this guy's shoulders and, and looking him deep in the eye and, and saying those words, do not fear only believe. And that phrase is where this whole sermon series was really born. You know, there's over a hundred times in the scriptures when the Lord says something like this to us, where he says, do not fear. And so what this story and, and all those other instances tell us is that the Christian life, even though it's, it's not always without the temptation of fear, it is not to be a life that is defined by fear. It, it's not that when you follow Christ that trouble is gone, but fear is gone. Why? Well, consider the, the rest of the story, if you know how this story goes. You know, Jesus, he gets into town, uh, he goes to the house, he gets Jairus, he gets Jairus' wife, they, they get all them together, and they get some of the disciples that are closest to him together, they go into the house, and this is how the story ends. It says, taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Now for us on, on this side of history, knowing how the story ends, it's easy for us to look at that phrase in the middle, do not fear, and, and agree and be like, yeah, Jarius, do not fear. Okay, Jesus has got it. And it's easy for us to say that because we know the end of the story. But if we're honest, we tend to, um, to wonder if God is going to show up in a big way when we're in the middle of the story. And sometimes we take the people that are in the scriptures and we, we kind of put them over there as though they're other or they're uh, something different or maybe even fictitious, that they're not real people. And then when something difficult is dropped into our lives, into our lap, into our situation, we have a hard time reconciling it and we wonder if God will show up in a big way in our life or if he'll just simply forget us or overlook us. And at one point or another, we've, we've all been in this position, I, I'm sure, in some ways. I mean, maybe today uh, you're walking into a season of life or maybe you're already in that season of life that you're not ready for. And you've been praying over it, you've been praying for it, and you just feel like your prayers are falling on deaf ears. Or maybe you're in a relationship and that relationship, you know, I mean, it's the farthest thing from healthy. And you've been praying for it, you've been praying over it, and you have no peace. It sounds like God is just silent. Or maybe in financial, you know, a loss of a job or a cutback at work, or maybe even on the flip side of that, you're in a position you never thought you'd be in where you, now you have a promotion and you're actually making more money, but your career is taking a weird path that you never wanted it to take. Or health, right? The doctor is giving you that phone call and, and it's not gonna end your life, but it's gonna change the way you live the rest of your life. And if we're honest with each other, it's very difficult in the middle of situations like that to have somebody look us in the eye and say, do not fear, or to have somebody misquote some sort of scripture about finding strength. But on the God side of things, you're praying and you don't hear anything. You're begging him and you don't see anything. But what I wanna show us today is he hasn't forgotten because as we'll see in some of these stories, he doesn't forget those who he loves. 
You see, the folks in scriptures, they're not over there. They're not other. These folks were real people and they wrestled with real things just like we did. And so to start us off, I want you guys to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to John 11. If not, it'll be on the screens. It's in your notes as well. See, in John 11, we're introduced to a family and this family has become very close to Jesus. They live in the town called Bethany. Bethany is about a little under two miles away from Jerusalem. And many folks, many scholars and commentaries, they believe that um, while in Jerusalem doing his ministry, Jesus would stay in Bethany. He would stay there and he began uh, to develop this relationship with his family of these three siblings. There was Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then at the beginning of John 11, he gets this news. It says, now there was a certain man, he was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Martha who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother was Lazarus. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now John, the author of this gospel, he's an eyewitness. He was one of Jesus' closest disciples. He was in the room when that little girl was raised back from the dead. He goes out of his way in this story three different times to make sure that we understand that Jesus loved this family. Two of them we just saw. He goes out of his way to make certain that all of us understand Jesus loved this family, but he doesn't come off as very loving. See, if you just kind of erase what you know about the end of this story, and right now you're in the middle of the story, just imagine how he's coming off here, because he says this illness will not end in death. But then look at verse 14 and 15. It says, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And then again, look at verse six. This is curious. It says, so so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, when he heard his friend, that somebody who he loved dearly was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, if he loved Mary and he loved Martha and he loved Lazarus so much, why wouldn't he have dropped everything and ran to them? Why wouldn't he have saved Lazarus the pain of death and, and Mary and Martha the pain of grief? I think it's because he had something a a whole lot bigger in mind, right? Look how, uh, let's pick it up here in verse 20. It says, uh, when Martha had heard, so the sisters are now coming to him. When Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Excuse me. Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives believes in me and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. I'm gonna pause us for a drink, (laughs) for allergies. That's why I hid this back here. (coughs) Excuse me. You should have come to the nine, I didn't cough at all. Waking up early has its advantages. Okay, <clears throat> back on track. But this feeling of being forgotten or unloved, it, it seeps into every one of us at some point. Um, I think we all wrestle with it. And I think that what they ask here is something or what they say here is something that if we're, if we're honest with each other, we, we all say at some point. And that's, Lord, if you had been here. That's the phrase that she uses. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you had been here, my My wife wouldn't have left. My health wouldn't have failed. My business wouldn't have flopped. Lord, if you had been here, my children wouldn't have wandered. 
And we ask if Jesus even really cares in the middle of our average situations. But he did care. You see, he knew exactly what he was doing in the life of Mary, in the life of Martha, and Lazarus, and you and me. You see, there's a reason why Jesus waited before he came to his friend. The simple math will show us that it wasn't Jesus' delay that caused Lazarus to die. That's a common misconception. Lazarus was already dead by the time the messengers reached Jesus. Because in verse 39, it tells us that he had been dead for four days and Jesus only waited two. So Lazarus at this point had already passed away and Jesus knew it. But Jewish tradition held this idea that when someone would pass away, that their soul would hang close to their body for three days. It was kind of this superstition or tradition that they had where the soul would hang close to the body for three days in case there was this chance of, of uh, reuniting and coming back to life again. And so Jesus waited for four days because that's when decomposition would kick in and, and they knew that there was no possibility. So beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lazarus was dead and he wanted to make sure before he made his next move. And I believe that's the reason why Jesus did this. I believe he wanted to go beyond superstition so that people knew what was happening. And Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. And she gives him that old like Sunday school nod of like, yeah, 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 I know. He'll rise again at the end of all things. You know, at the end of time, he'll rise again in the resurrection. I, I know that. And Jesus is like, no, Martha, listen, you have a very narrow view. What you're saying is correct, but I can do so much more than that. And so many people approach Jesus like this where they, they believe in Jesus, but only to the extent of how it applies to the afterlife, only to the extent of what happens at the end of this physical life. And many of us get stuck in that mentality that it doesn't matter on a daily basis. It only matters at the end of our life. And Jesus is saying, no, Martha, listen, this is what matters. I do matter at the end of your life, but only if I matter right now in the middle of it. See, resurrection, it's not a, just a gift that we get from God for believing all the right things. If we believe A, B, C, D, then God gives us this gift of resurrection. Jesus says, no, it, resurrection is not the gift. I am the resurrection. Like, I am the gift. Your life and relationship with me is what matters. And if you believe in that, then you will never die. Martha, do you believe that? And then Mary shows up, the other sister, and the conversation starts all over again. And she says, Lord, if you had been here. And at this point, Jesus just kind of, he, he just breaks. He breaks down and he begins to cry and he begins to weep. In fact, uh, this is where in the scriptures we get the passage, Jesus wept. Now, why is that passage famous? Shortest, <laughs> yeah, come on, I'm pulling you out, come on. Yeah, short, they say it's the shortest verse in the Bible. I'm gonna give you a little trivia to impress your friends. You ready? Okay. It's not the shortest verse. In the original language, 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says rejoice always. It's 14 letters long. Jesus wept is 16 letters long. You're welcome. Go impress your friends. Take them out to lunch and impress their socks off with your nerdy pastor knowledge there. Um, anyway, so Jesus, uh, he begins to, to weep. In our English translations, they don't really give it the, the best kind of connotation there. It, it sounds like just this tear rolling down his face, but this is an uncontrollable weeping out loud. So much so, he's making such a scene with how much he is crying over this situation that it says this in verse 36. It says, see, this is the Jews, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? You see, but Je Jesus wasn't sad about Lazarus' death. He knew exactly how all of that was gonna turn out. He wasn't crying over his friend. What he was crying about, what he was so upset about was that everybody around him who had seen him work these miracles and interacted with him, they had such a narrow view of who he was. And so he watched sin blind these two sisters that he loved dearly to where their perspective was Jesus only matters at the end. And that sin was what caused him to weep and Jesus had a much bigger plan in mind as Mary and Martha and the Jews all stood there and said, if you had only been here, things would have turned out different. And this is how the, the account finishes up in verse 38. It says, Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb and it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. 
Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Now, in the King James Version, it says, Lord, he stinketh. And I love that. I think that's so funny, right? So sometimes the classics are the best. Lord, he stinketh. (laughs) Anyway, back to death. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said on this account, I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So now that we're at the end of the story, not in the middle, not in the beginning, at the end, was Jesus late? No. Was he unloving? No, absolutely not. But we can only see that clearly because we're at the end of the story. When we're in the middle of the story, when the relationship is gone, when the financial problems are there, when uh, health begins to fail, things are not as clear. And there's another great example of this in the scriptures. Uh, If you want to, you can turn over to Mark Four, if not, it'll be on the screens there as well. I'm just gonna read this whole account. Four verses, uh, starting in verse 35, it says, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go to the other side. And evening, and leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. See, this is, why I, this is why I like to take naps. Jesus took naps, so it's totally biblical. You can take naps, right? If anybody dogs on you, be like, Jesus took naps. And here's the thing about Jesus taking naps. He took them at the weirdest times. Just imagine this, this crazy storm that's happening where these disciples who are professional fishermen, professional boat people, couldn't handle the storm, and he slept through that. They're like, I can sleep heavy. My wife always gets, I can sleep through anything. I don't think I could sleep through that. And he slept through that. And the disciples were just overwhelmed so much that they yell out this phrase that again, I think all of us at one point have had this, where they just yell out, don't you care? Right right in the middle of their situation, don't you care about what's happening? Don't you care that we're dying here? But in both instances, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Mary and Martha and Lazarus. The disciple, their stories are not other. They're not over there. He knew exactly what he was doing. And get this, with three words in both of those cases, with three words, he completely changed the circumstances. Lazarus, come out. Peace, be still. See, there's so much power when God speaks into our situation. So much power. And I wanna show you that I believe that God has spoken into each of our situations, no matter what we're going through. There are three truths I wanna teach you from these accounts, and if you're taking notes with them, there are the three on there. I want you to remember this, that the resurrection that we celebrated just three weeks ago in Easter, the scriptures say the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in his followers. So here is Jesus' three promises to each of us. It says that Jesus is always in control of uncontrollable situations. He's always in control. I want us to go back to the prayer that he prayed right before the Lazarus account. Okay, go right back to that prayer, starting in verse 41. He says, Father, I thank you that you have always heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. What's interesting about this prayer is this is not the prayer that actually brought Lazarus back to life. It seems as though Jesus has already prayed this. He already knows what's going to happen. 
right? This was just for the benefit of the people standing around. None of this caught him off guard. This wasn't a last minute request to raise Lazarus. So he was in control of the illness the whole time, the death the whole time, the waves crashing over the boat the whole time. He's always in control. It's what we call uh, sovereignty, meaning that he's in control of all things. So the farthest away galaxy that we haven't even yet discovered, Jesus is in control of that. All the way down to the tiniest molecule that's holding the bench that you're sitting on. He's in control of all things. And you might be walking through something right now and you feel like you have control of it. We've all been there, right? We're, we're, we feel like we have the control of this situation, but we're really struggling through it. And our reality is that we can't control it. But as humans, we, we have a tendency to try to control it. Now, let me give you a little example here. I've, I've told you guys before, like, I, you know, I have quirks. As your pastor, I have a quirks. Um, I'm not a huge sports person. I don't want to watch a whole lot of TV. But I'll give you this. When I was first married, before we had kids, one of my favorite things to do was after uh, church on Sunday, Alice and I would go home. And uh, Sunday afternoon is prime TV watching time for dumb things, okay? And so I love to watch infomercials. I've never bought anything from an infomercial, but I love watching infomercials because I just feel like there's something about infomercials. They make us look so stupid, right? That we can't close Tupperware on our own, so we need a machine. And so I would just watch these and I would love to watch them and I would feel like there is a bullet-shaped blender hole in my heart that nothing can fill except for this bullet-shaped blender that I need in my life to make my breakfast omelets amazing when all my friends come over. That's not even part of the illustration. So uh, sometimes infomercials wouldn't be on, but that's where they would tuck away the bad sports, right? Like the badminton tournament on Sunday afternoons or, or sometimes bull riding. Have you guys ever watched bull riding? Has anybody here rode a bull? No, I didn't think so. Don't even raise your hand. I'm not gonna believe you. So bull riding. But this is how we are in these uncontrollable situations. So like, here's you in the middle of the situation, right? You look like you're in control, this uncontrollable situation. You have a tight grip. Check out the cow's face. Who's really in control there, right? Right, yeah. But from everyone watching it, it looks like you're in control of that, that medical diagnosis, that behavior issue with your kids, whatever it may be. You look like you're in control. And you tighten your grip down, but then this is your reality. Your situation, it, internally, it's just throwing you around, right? It, it's throwing you around like a rag doll and you think you're in control because you have one little finger on that circumstance or that situation. But you know it's causing you sleepless nights and headaches and stress. And eventually, you can't ride that thing forever. It will throw you to the ground and it will bury you under your stress. And you can't handle it on your own. It's out of your control. And you were never meant to handle it on your own. So what do we do with it? Well, we take examples of the real people who are not other, the real people in the scriptures. Like Jarius, we come to Jesus and we fall at his feet. We lay down our pride and we say, I, I just need you to do something here. I just need you to intervene. And like Mary and Martha, we, we bring our situation to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but when Mary and Martha send the messenger to Jesus, one thing they don't do is they never ask Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. All they say is, the one whom you love is ill. And they, and they just give that to him. Like, we trust you to do something with this. We're not gonna tell you what to do. We're not gonna ask you what to do. We're just gonna simply say, Lazarus is ill. And the same with the disciples in the boat. Sometimes we just have to admit when we're drowning. And when he's invited in, Jesus will show you how much he's in control. Because in the middle of loss, in the middle of any situation, and he can speak like nobody else can speak into your life. But here's the thing, when he brings things back to life, when he resurrects things, it may not always look like we thought it would. It may not always look like we thought it would. But we just need to give him control and let him take over and then follow him. Second is Jesus has perfect timing that is seldom ours. You see, in both of these accounts, in the account of Lazarus and the disciples in the boat, it seems like Jesus has horrible timing. He shows up too late to save Lazarus. He falls asleep in the middle of the boat, in the middle of the storm. God often seems late to us because he doesn't operate on our expected timetable. He doesn't come through when we expect him to come through into our life. It, often it feels like God is sleeping in the midst of whatever storm we're dealing with. And we worry so much about tomorrow. Just like Ali was sharing, we worry so much about things and we have no idea what's gonna happen. We don't even know what's gonna happen 15 minutes from right now. But God does. He knows exactly what's gonna happen because he exists outside of our time. 
Now, I, that's really hard to wrap your mind around. So let, let me just kind of share with you a conversation that I had. Uh, Allison and I like to sit our three kids down uh, every evening and, and read through a Bible together, read through one of the, the different Bibles we have and pray together. And one of my favorite things is when the kids bring up different questions at the end. But just for the parent side of thing, I just wanted to kind of share with you some of the ones that we have used over the years that have been fantastic. So, you know, when you're a parent, you kind of start off with one of these, right? It's like, they're really colorful. They kind of cover all the fluffy stories of the Bible. They make everything really fun for the little ones and you get to read through it with them. And that's a great place to start. But many times they leave out um, some of the, the deeper things in scripture. And so we've kind of progressed over the years and we really like this next one, this Jesus storybook. Uh, it's not word for word from the scriptures, but it is written so poetic. The illustrations are beautiful in this thing. It, that's well worth it alone. But the Jesus storybook is fantastic. And then being the, the Lego lovers we are, we have these ones as well. These are the brick Bibles. Uh, they can't use the word Lego because of copyright, right? Um, but an atheist actually did these two. He, he illustrated every scene out of the King James Bible with Legos. He spent years and hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this, and I'll just give you parents a heads up. This is, this will, one will bring up questions. Like, the, he doesn't skip anything, anything, like anything. He doesn't skip anything, okay? So, fair warning, anything, all right. It's a good, it's a good one, but doesn't skip anything. Okay, the next one, Action Bible. Uh, this is like a comic book, and they actually have it in print, which we have, and then on the iPad, too, that kind of animates it and comes out. Uh, and man, my boys love this one. This is fantastic. It is animated so well, or illustrated so well, uh, and it follows the scripture word for word really well. And then finally, the, the Bible app is one that we've really loved. If you have any kind of smart device, you can put that on there. It's interactive, like they can click on the characters, the characters do things and all that. Um, and so that's a great one too. So we mix it up with all those different ones. But every evening, we sit down with one of those and we read a story out of it. We let them pick or we go through each one at a time. Uh, and, and one evening, the topic came up of time and heaven. Like when we're Beyond this life, when we're with Jesus in the new creation, what is time like? And I was trying to explain to them that time doesn't exist there as we know it, at least as we, we know it, because time is something that God created for us, right? And so I was trying to give them a little quiz to pull them out a little bit. I was like, okay, so how do we tell time? And they said a clock. And I was like, okay, that's fair. Daddy asked a stupid question. Uh, all right. How do, without clocks, how do we tell time? And they said, your cell phone. And I was like, no, 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 that's, that's a clock on the phone. So there's a giant ball of flame in the sky, children, that lets us know it's not nighttime. Oh, the sun, right, okay. Well, in the scriptures, it tells us that at the end of all things, that there is no sun, there is no moon, the light comes from Jesus himself. And so now we no longer have 24-hour days. We don't have time like, like we have time now. And I still don't think they get it. I don't think they understand it, but we'll probably have that conversation a million more times. But our perception of time is based on something that God created for us, and so that he's outside of that creation. So he runs on a totally different timetable than you and I run on. God exists outside of time. And, and the Apostle Peter, he gave us a little allusion to it when he said this. He said, do not overlook this fact, this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So you can always trust that God will show up at the perfect time. He is never late because he doesn't exist inside of our time. He shows up exactly when he means to. And if you continue to think of that preconceived idea of God needs to show up at this time in this way, then you're only setting yourself up for disappointment and worry. And Jesus taught us again, Matthew 6, to not worry. He says, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. The third, it says Jesus never forgets, but we often forget him. We may wonder if God has forgotten us, our illness or our pain or our suffering or struggle. And we might wonder if God is sleeping in the middle of our story, in the middle of our situation. But I want you guys to look back on all of those accounts that we just talked about. Where was Jesus when the waves were crashing over the boat? He was in the boat, right? Where was he when his friend Lazarus needed him? He was right in the middle of that situation. Where, were you, where was he when Jairus was in the middle of his tragedy? He was right there. Jesus didn't forget about these people, but his friends and these people around him, they forgot who he was. 
And I wanna draw your attention to a couple of verses here. The very last words that Jesus gave us before he left the earth again, he said this, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says this in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if God has promised this to us, who is forgetting whom? Church, I wanna encourage you today that if we submit our lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that means he is our sovereign leader, sovereignty, controlling all things. His spirit is in us, he'll never leave us, he'll never forget about us. He created us, he loves us, and he is right where he means to be. But if you choose to take your life into your own hands, he loves you so much that he'll let you. He'll let you walk away. He'll let you take on the consequences of your own decisions because he loves you that much. And you can leave God, but he'll never leave you. He'll always be right there. And God never forgets. It's impossible for him to get because he's all knowing. And and I said in this story that, that John goes out of his way three times to mention that he loves this family And I would say that in the scriptures, there are thousands of verses. In fact, the whole collection of all 66 books that make up the scriptures here is his way of saying he loves you. He knows everything you're walking through. He knows and he is deeply interested in every detail of it. In fact, I'll prove it to you. So until right now when I mention this, I I bet none of you were thinking, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, right? Nobody was thinking about, now you're all thinking about your breathing. You're all thinking about your breath. A couple of you could use some mints, it's okay. But none of you were thinking about that. But God was thinking that. He was providing that breath, every single breath for you because he's sovereign over every single thing that happens. He never forgets about us. But my question to all of us, church, is, is do we forget about him? Because if we really know who God is, we will never forget the things that he can do. He's all powerful and with one word, he spoke our creation into existence with just words. He he stood on that boat and he said to that sea, be still. With three words, he rose a guy from the dead. Does that not blow your mind? Like just because we've read it so many times doesn't make it less amazing. He brought Jairus' daughter back from the dead. He brought Lazarus back from the dead and to top it off, he brought himself back from the dead. I'm gonna follow that guy. I don't know everything about him, but that's enough for me. So here's what I want us to do to close our time. I want, him to, I want him to have an opportunity to speak over whatever your situation is. Maybe I named it in some of those examples. Maybe it's something totally different that has come to your mind. But I wanna give him a chance to speak over it. So what I want us to do, all of us, I'm not gonna do anything weird. I just want you to close your eyes. I, this is just for you. I just want you to close your eyes. And in your mind, in your heart, I want you to picture that one thing that, that he was bringing to your mind this whole time. The thing that he was bringing to your heart this whole time. What is that situation? What is the thing where you feel like he doesn't care, he's not here, his timing is off, whatever it may be, that he's forgotten you, he's passed over you. Picture that one thing. And I wanna remind you that with three words, he resurrected Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. And with three words, he calmed a raging sea. Peace, be still. And today, I want you to hear this. The one who loves you dearly has three words for you. That's where we began this series. Do not fear. Our Father, when we allow the truth of your words to saturate into us, We can watch fear melt away and bravery take its place. So in the face of sadness, in the face of loss, in the face of anger, we can be brave because we know who you are and what you have done for us. That if we would no longer allow fear to define us as followers of Jesus, instead allow the resurrection to define us as followers of Jesus, that we are people that have hope and fear is not the end of the situation, that you can walk into anything and bring it back to life. If we lived by that, 
what a tremendous change it would make not only in our lives, but in the lives of everyone around us. And so, Father, that is my prayer for this church sitting before me, that you would give them power, that you would give them courage, that you would give them bravery as they go to work, as they go to school, as you, they land wherever you have placed them, that you would give them bravery because of who they are in Jesus Christ. And so it is in the name of Jesus that we pray, his loving and his gracious and his forgiving and beautiful and sovereign name we pray, amen.